And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. First, we will hear from Commander Brandon Heitmeyer, who is a consumer safety officer within the Division of Compounding One from the Office of Compounding Quality and Compliance in FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. This presentation will be followed by Dong Chun Huang, a consumer safety officer also from the Division of Compounding One um, within the Office of Compounding Quality and Compliance as well. Now, please join me in welcoming our first presenter, Commander Heitmeyer. Hello, welcome all to the Environmental Monitoring for Compounding webinar hosted by CEDAR SBIA. I am Brandon Heitmeyer, a regulatory officer and FDA's CEDAR's Office of Compounding Quality and Compliance. Together with my colleague, Don Trang Bong, I will be your virtual person, we will be your virtual presenters for this webinar. We hope that you find that this webinar is informative and look forward to your questions and feedback at the end of the presentation. Since this webinar is approved for continuing education credits, we must, of course, have some learning objectives. So upon completion of this webinar, you should be able to basically define environmental monitoring or abbreviate it as EM and have some basic knowledge of the statutory and regulatory requirements of EM for compounding facilities, both 503A and 503B. And identify types of EM, recognize the design and implementation, implementation concepts related to EM and, uh, and personnel monitoring, uh, which I will abbreviate sometimes as PM. Overall, our topics for discussion for this webinar, uh, of course, mirror the learning objectives, as you see here um, on this slide, which come from the previous slide. The content of the webinar is driven by statutory and regulatory requirements, but not everything can be included in statutory and regulatory sources. So the agency utilizes public guidance documents to convey the agency's current thinking on a topic. Just to digress, when I say statutory requirements, I'm speaking of laws passed by Congress, such as the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and amendments thereafter. And when I speak of regulatory requirements, I'm referring to regulations that have been published in the Federal Register, such as 21 CFR Part 211, also known as the drug CGMPs, FDA guidance, as you see listed in this slide, is intended to give more information on a topic beyond statutes and regulations. As such, these are the main guidances utilized for this webinar. EM includes conducting certain tests, like sampling the air or surface, conducting essays, and taking measurements regarding the conditions of an environment, such as the temperature, the differential pressure or humidity of a controlled area. Particle monitoring is what we think most of when we hear the term environment monitoring, uh, but it's a bit more than that. Environmental monitoring is required in production of drugs intended to be sterile, specifically during aseptic processing and at certain steps in terminally sterilized operations. Environmental monitoring and non-sterile drug production should also be conducted. However, it's less rigorous than in sterile production. However, EM in non-sterile production can be used as a good tool to understand bio burden levels and potential routes of contamination. Overall, the type of EM and the frequency of EM or testing depends on the type of drug production. Operate uh, the type of operation and should be commiserate of whatever risk that operation poses. Let's talk about what EM is good for and what EM data can be used for. Overall, it's a great quality metric. So, in terms of cleanliness of things, uh, 
Things can look spotless to the eye, very clean to the eye, but what can the eye not see? So environment monitoring gives you data on the environment beyond what the eye can see, certainly. EM can also help you monitor the adequacy of cleaning procedures over the long run, whether your disinfection agents and the use thereof are effective against the flora in your facility, but it's also much more than that. For example, HVAC, HVAC systems. So EM lets you know early on when you have HVAC issues. Trouble maintaining temperature, uh, humidity fluctuations, or low pressure or high pressure of airflow uh, would be a, a clue if you were doing that type of EM monitoring. Humans are certainly the dirtiest things in a clean room, hands down. No pun intended. And EM combined with personal monitoring, PM, let you know if staff are being hygienic and gowning properly. And possibly an insight to some behaviors that may be problematic in an aseptic environment. Uh, there are certain people who are labeled as shedders that shed a high amount of skin cells and environmental monitoring may clue you in on if that might be an issue with one of your operators. EM data can help you investigate sources of contamination. For example, if you recovered a water microbe in the clean room, it, it may direct you to look for a water intrusion source. And then after doing such investigation, you find out that you actually have a roof leak somewhere. What EM is not? It is certainly not a release test. EM does not directly inform on the quality of the drug product or the batch. It does provide information about the quality of the production environment, which may have an impact on the quality of the drug product. It is not precise or reproducible. Microbial contamination is not uniformly distributed, either in the air or on surfaces or in liquids or anything. A false negative uh, EM test can occur uh, due to problems of recovery, uh, stress and on the microbe, a lot of different factors come into play there for a negative EM. So, um, you know, no CFUs doesn't always actually mean there is no CFUs. A single EM sample and test result can all, only tell you uh, what was detected that the specific sampling location at the specific time, uh, given there was optimal conditions for recovery, is what was actually viable there at that, that time and location. EM is not always representative. EM results may not be representative of an entire facility, of course. There are many variables controlling, maintaining the environment in a controlled area. Therefore, any localized Fluctuations in these variables, such as a drop in differential pressure or humidity, etc., can change the environment. And since microbial contamination is not uniformly distributed in the air or on surfaces or likewise anywhere else, detection of microbial growth or lack thereof is one area of the controlled area that does not represent the entire facility. EM is not a definitive proof of cause and effect. It can be difficult to prove cause and effect based solely on the results of environmental monitoring. In particular, low level contamination can be particularly difficult to detect. It's literally finding a needle in a haystack, except this needle is microcosmic, right? The three sections under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, also known as F, the FD and C Act, uh, that are applicable to compound drug products are sections 501A, 503A, and 503B. In sanitary conditions defined under section 501A to A, apply to both 503A facilities 
and outsourcing facilities, 503B. However, CGMP requirements under Section 501A to B apply to outsourcing facilities, which are also called 503Bs, and not 503As. They also apply to traditional drug manufacturers, CGMPs that is. The, 50, the 501A section of the act has to do with adulteration, which includes in sanitary conditions and CGMPs, whereas 503A and 503B sections lay out statutory definitions and conditions for each establishment. For example, the requirement for the supervision of a licensed pharmacist and an outsourcing facility is found in section 503B. Section 501A2A of the, Fed, of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, FDNCA, states that a drug is deemed to be adulterated if it has been prepared, packed, or held under insanitary conditions, whereby it may have been contaminated with filth. So it may have been contaminated with filth, and whereby it may have been rendered injurious to health. So it doesn't have to be proven, it just has to be may have. The conditions have to be exist have to be present for such contamination to occur. It doesn't have to be proved that there's actual contamination in the drug product. So examples of drugs contaminated with pills can include non-microbial contamination or microbial contamination. Can chemical contamination or some other form of contamination that is injurious to health. So in the most basic scenario, this is the dirty factory clause within the law. So producing drugs in a dirty factory, the conditions are insanitary and whereby that makes the drug adulterated, even if uh, there's no what I mean to say is you don't have to actually prove that each drug product um, has contamination in this clause. Since the factory is dirty, the drugs are all deemed adulterated. But <clears throat> this uh, insanitary conditions clause goes beyond that, what is perceived as the dirty factory in a global sense, for example, in a compounding situation, compounding a sterile drug in an ordinary room without HEPA filtered air would be an insanitary condition, even if the room was visually clean. That it, that's because there are not controls in place such to produce aseptic conditions in the room. Section 501A2B of the FDNC Act states that a drug is deemed to be adulterated if the methods used in or the facilities or controls used for its manufacture processing, processing pack, packing or holding do not conform to or not operated or administered in conformity with current good manufacturing practice to assure that the drug is, meets the requirements of this act as to the safety and as to the identity and strength and meets the quality and purity characteristics which it purports or is represented to represented it to possess. Current good manufacturing practices or CGMPs are regulations promulgated by the agency through the Federal Register. Currently for finished drugs you can find CGMPs per se in 21 CFR parts 210, 211, and 212. Drug products that meet the requirements of Section 503A are exempt from Sections 501A2B, 502F1, and 505 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Sections 502 and 505 have to do with directions for use for prescription drugs and prior approval of FDA, respectively. Certain provisions in 503A address the preparation uh, by a licensed pharmacist or, or licensed physician, preparation for individual patients 
based on a receipt of a valid prescription. These are just to name a few of the aspects of 503A. Drugs prepared in accordance with 503A of the FDNC Act are exempt from CGMPs. Of note here, this legal exemption is for each drug product. It does not give a blanket exemption over the facility. Section 503B provides exemptions from other sections of the Act. As you see in this slide, for the drugs that are compounded by or under direct uh, supervision of a licensed pharmacist and a facility that has registered as an outsourcing facility with the FDA, certain pr provisions in 503B address the conditions listed in the slide. But in plain language, a 503B compounded drug does not require pre-approval from FDA or extensive directions for use. So think of the package insert for a commercial prescription drug when you think of extensive directions for use. And of course, there are other exemptions that I won't go into here. But there's a big, big but with emphasis here, if you will, is that drugs prepared in accordance with Section 503B of the FDNC Act must meet CGMP requirements, unlike those compounded under 503A. So at a minimum, we're talking 210 and 211. The exemptions in Sections 503A and 503B are the basis for the differences in the regulatory expectations for 503A facilities and outsourcing facilities, also called 503B sometimes. Speaking only of adulteration, 501A2A, which we call insanitary conditions, applies to both 503As and 503Bs. Outsourcing facilities and 501A2B, or CGMPs, apply to outsourcing facilities so 5013Bs and traditional drug manufacturers. FDA has a guidance for industry titled Insanitary Conditions at Compounding Facilities, where FDA lays out what the agency views as an insanitary condition. And in this document, FDA asserts that the lack of adequate environmental monitoring is an insanitary condition. The agency's view is that Environmental monitoring provides information about the quality of the aseptic processing environment, and corrective actions should be taken when potential routes of contaminations are identified. Environmental monitoring is an expectation under both insanitary conditions and CGMPs. Thus, both 503As and 503Bs need to have an adequate EM program for aseptically produced drugs to be considered to be in compliance. Under insanitary conditions, all compounders, including 503A facilities, should perform environmental monitoring and implement corrective actions when monitoring data indicates the drug production environment has been compromised. Under CGMP requirements, outsourcing facilities must perform environmental monitoring and investigate any failures and implement corrective actions, that's CGMPs, when monitoring data indicates the drug production environment has been compromised. Again, lack of EM may constitute an insanitary condition in 503A compounding, and lack of EM and any relevant investigation is considered a CGMP violation by FDA for an outsourcing facility specifically. Now I will discuss some regulatory expectations for EM as it relates to an outsourcing facility. Under CGMP requirements, EM goes beyond collecting samples and testing. CGMPs require that you establish a system for EM in all applicable areas. So for example, the surfaces in uh, an aseptic processing area must be cleanable surfaces. In other words, they must be smooth, durable to cleaning uh, and disinfection agents. So think of 
stainless steel. Some type of material like that. Under 42C of the Part 211, the requirement for a system involving EM is laid out in plain text. Also, the requirements for separate areas and controls are laid out here. Environmental monitoring includes the following tests, essays, and measurements. However, this list is not all inclusive. So, of course, there's non viable particle monitoring of the air. There's also viable particle monitoring of the air and the surfaces. And then you have personnel monitoring too. So that includes the gloves of the aseptic operators, but also certain parts of the gown. And then you have differential pressure of the room and uh, supporting rooms. And then you have the temperature of the room and sometimes supporting rooms might come into play for that. And then humidity, of course, of the room. Um, in 2020, FDA um, published a draft uh, guidance for industry. It was titled uh, Current Good Manufacturing Practices. Guidance for Human Drug Compounding Outsourcing Facilities under Section 503B of the FDNC Act, which when finalized will reflect FDA's current thinking on compliance with the GMP requirements specifically for 503B facilities. This guidance includes the following recommendations for an environmental monitoring system. So we have sampling methods, should be based on uh, risk or peer reviewed literature and sampling locations should be supported by scientific justification. So also based on risk and then uh, environmental monitoring should be performed for sterile and non-sterile production areas over to over the facility in general. And then frequency of monitoring should be commensurate with risk. The recommendation for how frequently environmental monitoring should be performed differs for 503A and 503B facilities. In this slide, we have laid some laid out some CGMP EM differences for sterile and non-sterile production. These recommendations are taken directly from the 2020 FDA draft guidance for industry titled Current Good Manufacturing Practice Guidance for Human Drug Compounding Outsourcing Facilities under Section 503B of the FDNCA. As you can see from the slide, the specifics are laid out more so for sterile drugs, where we have more extensive daily monitoring and covering production times and shifts. For viables, you want to monitor very frequently for stair operations, whereas periodically, such as quarterly, may be acceptable for no stair production. These are recommendations. What types of monitoring and what frequency an outsourcing facility needs is really depend on the operations and the facility design. Why do we care about non-viable particles and what are they? Well, other than general filth, like a dusty shelf, we know that microbes spread and move via particles. Microbes don't have the ability to fly. So basically, they hitch a ride on these small particles, such as dust, paint chips, hairs, fibers, etc. And in that manner, they make their way through, the, through an environment. So when we measure and monitor non-viable particles, we are, look, we are not looking at whether they have microbes attached or not. Rather, we are just using specialized equipment to detect and quantify the particles. The table in the slide here provides the limits for particles in a cubic meter of air for each ISO classification standard. As noted, this is for 0.5 micron or larger particles only. The standard comes from the ISO 14644-1, which is the ISO standard for clean rooms and controlled environments.
Non-viable particles are detected and counted by instruments commonly cal called counters. This slide illustrates the different types and different models of counters. Which type and model you use depends on the application and design of the controlled area. Where should non-viable particles be counted? Well, the 2004 FDA guidance for industry titled Sterile Drug Products Produced by Aseptic Processing, Current Good Manufacturing Practice recommends some of the following. Measurements in critical areas at sites where there is most there, where is the most potential risk to be exposed to sterilized products or containers or closures. So you want to test very near to those points. Uh, the sample site, in other words, where the probe aperture is placed should be taken into account and that the location is representative of the operations. So normally not more than one foot away from the site where the work is actually being done and by work, aseptic work. Within the airflow, not contrary to it or against it or the other way or any other orientation. Uh, by site, I mean where the aseptic manipulation is occurring and by the airflow is whether it's horizontal, or vertical or whatnot. Also, the particle counting probe should be placed in an orientation that's demonstrated to obtain a meaningful sample. Again, in the direction of the airflow. If, if it's a vertical airflow, you want to see the aperture of the probe placed vertical. If it's horizontal, likewise. So if the airflow is vertical to the probe, again, if that's the way it should be horizontal, then it should also be horizontal. If there's any other kind of different airflow that I haven't mentioned here, that I'm, that I'm not aware of it. In this slide, we have a counter placed on the far left of the hood, denoted by the red circle. The red arrow shows the approximate site of the aseptic work activity. Do you see anything wrong in this photograph with respect to probe placement? There are two things that should jump out at you. One, the distance of the probe looks to exceed one foot from where the aseptic activity is being performed. But also, look at the height. The probe is much higher than the operator's hand. Also, the orientation of the probe is perpendicular to the airflow as it appears in the picture because the picture as such appears that this is a horizontal flow hood, not a vertical flow hood. The next two slides have some examples of 43 observations pertaining to environment monitoring. For those who are not aware, a 43 observation is the agency's way of reporting in writing to affirm a condition which may violate applicable laws and regulations. 483s, uh, a 483 is a form number for inspectional findings. These 483 observations have been redacted as to protect any confidential information. So those are the gray boxes that you see covering up some of the text. That's confidential information. But we can see from the redacted observation that the issue here is that non -viable, the non-viable particle probe is not in close proximity to the aseptic activity. In this slide, we have two 43 observations. Part B at the top is uh, basically for not doing environmental monitoring with adequate frequency and pointing out the fact that this firm had contamination of one CFU or more in the ISO 5 previously when they did do EM. ISO 5 areas are expected to be free of viable microbes. If you don't do EM, at a sufficient frequency, you are more or less flying blind. 
And the second example is for not monitoring non-viable particles during production. Production, of course, is the most critical time when components or container closures are exposed to the environment. When should we when when should non-viable particles be counted? FDA's draft guidance for industry titled Current Good Manufacturing Practice Guidance for Human Drug Compounding Outsourcing Facilities under Section 503B of the FDNC Act provides some recommendations for this. A septic style drug production environment should be monitored at least daily during production. Monitoring should cover all production shifts and include monitoring during normal production conditions and include at least daily monitoring of the ISO 5 areas. These recommendations are suggested monitoring frequencies for outsourcing facilities that follow CGMP requirements. However, the frequency of non-viable particle monitoring differs for 503A and 503B facilities. For 503As, the frequencies is less since they are not subject to GMPs. But again, less monitoring equals less data, so therefore you might be flying blind. So the question is, do you want more data about your environment or do you want less? More in this case is always better. Okay, so now it is time for our challenge questions. Uh, this is what helps keep our um, continued education units uh, to be viable. So here's the first one, true or false in sanitary conditions, 501A2A are applicable to outsourcing facilities, 503B only. I'm sorry, I read that question wrong. In sanitary conditions, 501A2A are not applicable to outsourcing facilities, 503B. Only CGMPs, which are 50A2B, are applicable to outsourcing facilities. True or false? So the answer here is false. In sanitary conditions are legally applicable to all establishments who hold, manufacture, or repackage drugs. However, CGMPs incorporate the insanitary conditions per se. That is to say, you are you are compliant if you are compliant with CGMPs, you are most likely covered then with respect to insanitary conditions. But 503Bs should be aware of insanitary conditions and should review FDA's uh, guidance for industry document for insanitary conditions, which is a reference in this presentation. Okay, second challenge question is true or false, the viral particle limit for an ISO 5 classified area is one colony forming unit, one CFU. So the answer is false. ISO 14644-1, which is also the clean rooms and associated controlled environments, a section defines limits for the number of particles that are 0.5 microns or larger. The ISO standard does not set a limit for viable particles or CFUs. However, FDA recommends for viable limits in ISO classified areas, the FDA recommendations for, sorry, the FDA recommendations for viable limits in ISO classified areas can be found in FDA's guidance for industry titled Steel Drug Products Produced by Aseptic Processing Current Good Manufacturing Practice, which is referenced in this presentation. Thank you, Brandon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dawn Tran Vong, and to continue with today's presentation, I will start with environmental monitoring for viable particles. 
Monitoring for viable particles should be part of your environmental monitoring sampling plan, specifically doing drug production. Viable particles can be bacteria, yeast, or mold. Drain, sink, and water can all be sources of microbial contamination in your clean room. It's a concern for both drugs that are intended to be sterile as well as non-sterile drugs. Why do we care about viable particles? As previously mentioned, microbial contamination can occur in both non-sterile and sterile drug, and they can cause serious health risks to patients. Sterile drugs should be free of viable microbes. Visible micro microbial contaminations in or adjacent to the production area is an insanitary condition. FDA guidance for industry title in sanitary conditions at compounding facilities states that compounding facilities producing purportedly sterile drug products under insanitary conditions should not rely upon or cite a passing sterility test result as an indication of product sterility. Microbial contamination when present is not uniformly distributed within a batch. Therefore, it may not be identified in a sterility test. Compounding facility must correct all insanitary conditions at the facility regardless of whether the drugs pass a sterility test. Limitation of sterility testing. A passing sterility test result does not prove that the entire drug production batch is sterile. It is only indicate that no contaminating microorganism has been found in the test sample. Microbial contamination is not uniformly distributed in a product or in the samples. Therefore, if there is a low level of microbial contamination in a production batch, it may not always be detected. Doing testing alone, and this is where sampling size matters, as illustrated here. Environmental sampling also have its limitations. Microbial contamination is not uniformly distributed on surfaces or in the air, and environmental monitoring sampling do not always recover microorganisms present in the samples area. Low-level contamination can be particularly difficult to detect, and false negative can occur. Therefore, sampling location, type, and the number of samples taken does matter. Microbial testing is complicated. Different types of microbes have different growth requirements, differ in media or nutrients requirements, as well as temperature and incubation time parameters. Additional complication with microbial testing is some bacteria are healthy and can readily grow and divide. Others may be starved, dehydrated, or otherwise damaged and requires some time to recover before entering the exponential growth phase. This is important because the environments in our clean rooms are designed to be hostile to microorganisms, denying them the essential nutrients and water while subjecting them to harsh disinfectants and cleaning materials. Even more complication with microbes. The recovery of microbes from the environment is not reproducible. The types and conditions of the microbial recovery can vary depending on the sample surface, the sampling tools, and as mentioned in the previous slide, the environment within the clean rooms is designed to limit the available nutrients required for microbial growth. Therefore, microbes recover from environmental sampling oftentimes are nutrient starved. Interpreting result of microbial testing. Because there are many variables to consider, the results are not as precise as for analytical testing. The alert and action levels should be established based on data collect in your facilities. When establishing the microbial or airborne particle level, remember, the alert level should give early warnings of potential drift from normal operating condition. Alert levels are always lower than the action levels, and action level when exceeded should trigger appropriate investigations and corrective actions.
what does microbial testing data tell us? Microbial testing data is a qualitative result indicating the presence of contamination. It does not tell you that contamination is absent, even if no contamination is detected. A single recovery event may be significant. For example, if the test result exceeds the action level recovered from an ISO 5 environment, this may not necessarily result in a batch rejection. However, this should trigger an evaluation of all environmental monitoring data and a full investigation should be initiated to determine the potential source of contaminations and the impact to product quality. Adverse trends are significant. This is important, for example, when you have consecutive growth result from a single sampling location within your clean room. This may indicate a potential drift in your environmental monitoring control and a potential contamination risk in your clean room. If there is a microbial contamination observed, 503A should take corrective actions to remediate the microbial contamination. 503B outsourcing facilities should investigate for the root cause of the contamination and implement corrective and preventive action as needed. There are two methods used to monitor viable particles in the air, active air sampling and passive air sampling. Compounding facility and outsourcing facilities should perform active air sampling using device that can quantify the number of viable microbes per volume of air samples. These devices may be portable or fixed with remote capability. Passive air sampling is performed by sampling for viable microbes in the air over a defined time period, no more than four hours. This is a semi-quantitative test method. The use of settle plate is optional. In general, viable particles in the air should be monitored at least daily during production. Covering all production shifts and sampling locations should cover all classified rooms, ISO 5, ISO 7, and ISO 8. However, these recommendations are suggested monitoring frequency for outsourcing facility that follow CGMP requirement. How frequently monitoring should be performed differs for 503A and 503B facility and should be commensurate with risk to product. These are a few examples of sampling devices used to actively monitor viable particles in the air. They may be portable or fixed with remote option. They vary in their designs and air monitoring capability. The 2004 FDA guidance for industry title sterile drug products produced by aseptic processing current good manufacturing practice states. Manufacturers should be aware of a device air monitoring capabilities and the air samplers should be evaluated for its suitability for use in an aseptic environment based on collection efficiency, cleanability, ability to be sterilized, and disruptions of unidirectional airflow. Tools used to detect microbial contamination on surfaces. Contact plates, bunches, and swabs can all be used to perform surface sampling in your production area. An important consideration when selecting the type of media used for surface sampling is, does it have any neutralizing property to counteract the potential cleaning or disinfectant residues that may be present in your production area? In the 2004 FDA guidance for industry title sterile drug products produced by aseptic processing, current good manufacturing, Practice states, media used for environmental monitoring should not be exposed to decontamination cycle residue as recovery of microorganisms would be inhibited. In general, surface sampling should be taken at least daily as soon as is possible after operations are complete but before cleaning and disinfection.
It should cover all production shifts. Additionally, sampling site selection for surfaces should cover various location within the classified ISO 5, 7, and 8 rooms. Here are a few examples of some potential neutralizing agents and method that you can review. Alternative microbiological test methods can be considered for environmental monitoring if it can demonstrate that the methods are equivalent or better than the traditional methods. Some rapid microbiological test methods are growth independent, such as scan RDI, relying on the detections of fluorescent dye taken up by viable cells, while other rapid microbiological test methods such as the bacteria method, are growth dependent. Personal monitoring and why is this performed? People are the primary source of contamination in clean room and can significantly affect the quality of the environment in which sterile products are processed. A vigilant and responsive program should be established as control. Personal monitoring should include sampling the gloves, fingertips, and other statistically selected locations of the operator gowns at an appropriate frequency that is commensurate with risk to products. Additionally, a more comprehensive monitoring program should be established for operators involved in operations which are more labor intensive, such as required repeated or complex aseptic manipulations. Your personal monitoring program should include sampling of the operator gloves and gown. Here are some recommendations for the frequency and sampling location for glove testing and gowning for outsourcing facility from the 2020 FDA draft guidance for industry title current good manufacturing practice, guidance for human drug compounding outsourcing facility under section 503B of the FDNC Act which when finalized will reflect FDA current thinking on compliance with CGMP requirement for outsourcing facility. Glove testing during routine operations should be monitored daily or for each shift during or immediately after completion of aseptic operations. Glove testing and selected locations on sterile gowns should be monitored during initial gowning qualification and at least annually. 503B facilities should also establish appropriate frequency for monitoring other critical sites of the gown, such as sleeve and forearms, during or immediately after completion of aseptic operations. Additional personal monitoring recommendations from the 2020 draft guidance for outsourcing facility includes outsourcing facilities should establish limits based on the criticality of operations relative to the contamination risk to the product. Should also investigate results that exceed established levels or demonstrate an average trend and determine the impact on the durability assurance of finished drug products intended to be sterols and develop and execute appropriate corrective action. More to consider, this applies to both 503A facilities and outsourcing facilities. The lack of adequate personal sampling is considered an insanitary condition, and glove testing should be samples after work in critical area before sanitizing gloves to assess for the actual operating conditions. For outsourcing facilities, the sample size selection for operator gown should be justified and samples should be collected after work in critical or classified areas and before sanitizing gowns and gloves with sterile alcohol. Here's another challenge question for you. True or false? Glove testing should be samples after work in critical area before glove sanitization. And the answer is true. Glove testing should be samples after work in critical area before glove sanitizations because it gives a more accurate assessment of the operation condition. 
Performing glove testing after sanitizations give an inaccurate representation of the operation condition and potentially provide a false negative result. Media use in environmental monitoring and personnel monitoring should be capable of detecting yeast and molds, as well as bacteria when incubate at appropriate temperatures and duration. Example media used for environmental monitoring include TSA, SDA, and R2A. Outsourcing facility can either perform global motion testing of in-house media or obtain the vendor CFA for purchased media. TSA plates should be incubated at 30-35 for two to three days for total aerobic bacteria count. And SDA plates should be incubated at 20-25 for five to seven days for total yeast and molds. When establishing the action and alert levels for viable particles, the levels should be established based on the relationship of sample location to the operation and the need to maintain microbiological control in the facilities. In some cases, you may choose to establish alternative action levels due to the nature of the operation or method of analysis. However, these, these selections should be justifiable and scientifically supported. The use of settled plates is optional if active air sampling is adequately performed. While the air classification for ISO 5 environments based on this table allow for 1 CFU per cubic meter of air, however, ISO 5 environments should normally yield no microbiological contaminants. When training the environmental and personnel monitoring data, each individual result should be evaluated for significance by comparisons to establish action and alert levels. Averaging test result may mask unacceptable conditions in localized areas. Remember, microbial contamination is not uniformly distributed. Data may be trended by locations, operator shift rooms, or other parameters. Quality units should establish procedures detailing the frequency with which data should be reviewed daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually. Written procedures should establish how responsible managers are notified of excursions. Environmental and personal monitoring data should be evaluated at least annually to determine if there is a need for any changes to manufacturing or facility controls. An example of an FDA 43 observation where the investigator cited the firm for deficiency regarding inadequate glove samplings and failures to conduct appropriate personnel and surface monitoring. Temperature and humidity monitoring within the classified and control non classified areas should be continuous. Prompt action should be taken to correct any humidity and or temperature fluctuations outside of the established normal range within your facility, as this may indicate a potential contamination risk to your clean room environment. Your environmental monitoring program should also include monitoring for differential pressure. Differential pressure should be continuously monitored between your classified areas and between classified and unclassified areas. Your environmental monitoring program should have established differential pressure limits with an alarm system to notify when there is an excursion. Positive pressures of 10 to 15 Pascal should be maintained between rooms of higher and lower air cleanliness with the door closed. If pressure reversals occur during operations that cannot be promptly corrected to prevent contamination during productions. Production should stop until a correction is made. The failure to detect and adequately address the change in air quality of any classified area before there is a loss of environmental control that may impact drug sterility is an insanitary condition. Examples include inadequate pressure differential 
between areas of higher quality air and low quality air. No or infrequent measurements of room pressures, differentials during operations to demonstrate proper airflow. Pattern of frequent or acute pressure reversals for areas of less clean airs to areas of higher air cleanliness. A two example of FDA 43 observation where the investigators cited the firm for failure to monitor or have a proper system in place to continuously monitor for differential pressure during production. For example, in this first observation, the investigator note that there is no verification of pressure differentials before or during sterile drug production. Additionally, in this second observation, the firm was cited for deficiency regarding the system for monitoring environmental conditions. Specifically, the firm is unable to provide documentations of positive pressure monitoring in the clean rooms during sterile drug productions. Here's a table summary of what, where, and how often environmental monitoring for outsourcing facilities should be conducted as discussed today. Please note these recommendations are suggested monitoring frequency for outsourcing facility that follows CGMP requirement. How frequently monitoring should be performed differ for 503A and 503B facility and should be commensurate with risk to product. Before we conclude, Brandon and I would like to express a special thank you to Jamila Hawaka, our FDA Senior Scientific Advisor with Cedar Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, Office of Quality Surveillance, for drafting this presentation for us. We also would like to say thank yous to Indivo, Heidi Molina, and Nicholas Bashor for their review, input, and support throughout the development of this presentation. With that, we would like to thank you for your time and attention. We will turn things back over for the question and answer session. All right, thank you again to our presenters for their excellent presentations and insights. Um, before we get to the question and answer session, we'll actually hear some information um, from Captain Jill Hammond, uh, Director of Training and Regulatory Science within the Office of Compounding Quality and Compliance. Um, so now I'll turn it over to Captain Hammond. Thank you, Lieutenant Commander. Um, this webinar was co-sponsored by the FDA Compounding Quality Center of Excellence. The mission of the Center of Excellence is to support outsourcing facilities, improve the quality of compounded drugs. This is a screenshot of our webpage, and I encourage you to visit our webpage to learn more about the Center of Excellence and our various program initiatives with training, our annual conference, research, and engagement. This is an overview of our training program as we have webinars and both instructor-led and self-guided online trainings on an array of CGMP topics. Today's webinar will be added soon and we will be launching our training schedule for the fall in a few weeks. So please check our webpage for new updates. I also want to encourage you all to register for our upcoming annual conference to be held in a few short weeks in late August. This year's conference will be hybrid, held both virtually and in person in Bethesda, Maryland. The conference will have in-depth sessions sharing various perspectives on quality, topics related to current good manufacturing practice, CGMP requirements, and leveraging knowledge and building partnerships for the future. A virtual pre-conference session is on developing a new outsourcing facility, Lessons Learned, which will be held on Monday, August 19th from 2 to 5 p.m. And the general conference begins on Wednesday, August 21st through Friday, August 23rd. Conference attendees will be eligible for free continuing education credits. And we encourage you to register with the QR code and by visiting the web link. We look forward to seeing you at the conference, our upcoming discussion series, and in future trainings. And I will now turn it back over to Lieutenant Commander Lim to begin the Q&A. 
Hey, thank you so much, Captain Hammond. So we'll, we'll now begin our question and answer panel. If you haven't had a chance to enter your question into the Q&A chat pod, please do so now. We'll answer as many questions as time allows. Now we'll see some questions we have coming in. Um, we'll start with some questions for Commander Heitmeyer. Uh, first question, are compounding sites expected to have disinfectant efficacy validations for their surfaces? Yes, uh, disinfectant efficacy studies should be conducted uh, per our 503B CGMP draft guidance uh, published in January 2020. Uh, we have there the suitability and efficacy of cleaning agents and cleaning methods should be evaluated. And the cleaning agents compatibility with applicable work surfaces should be assessed. Uh, published literature and supplier certificates of analysis can be relied on when initially determining the effectiveness of agents used to clean and disinfect as necessary and the facility and equipment services provided that the supplier's uh, cleaning procedures are followed. But there's also limitations uh, with respect to disinfecting agents and procedures which should be assessed. For example, 70% uh, isopropyl alcohol is ineffective against spore formers. So it's important that you also include a spore side in your disinfection program but other things like period of use should be assessed, especially if there's no directions or data provided by the manufacturer or your specific application where the way you're using it in your facility differs. So for example, if the label does not provide a statement such as discard after X number of days of opening the container, then you may need to establish your own time limitations in addition to efficacy alone. Thank you. Thank you so much for that response. Now we'll move to another question that came in for you. Um, should atypical isolates, e.g. gram negative, fungi, et cetera, be considered action level excursions? Yes, thank you for that wonderful question. Uh, so it depends on where they are recovered and the circumstances. While well, the recovery of atypical isolates, uh, such as gram-negative bacteria or, or fungi in your clean room may be a uh, cause for concern, the, the background details will likely dictate whether there's a need for a full investigation. So it depends, where, where are you discovering this at? Um, ISO 5, of course, certainly ISO 7, ISO 8, also cause for concern, certainly. Um, and then outside of that, it could be a trend. So what, what you also look at is what activity occurred when the sample was taken, uh, what type of sample it is, air, or surface, um, and you know what was going on during that time that you collected the sample, were, were you in production, um, and then, or just prior to production or after, is there a trend? And then are you getting multiple recoveries of the same isolates? So any significant changes in, in your flora and your facility should be considered in the review of an ongoing environmental monitoring data program. So of course, uh, atypical isolates and critical areas should be uh, an action level excursion, but outside of that, ISO 7, ISO 8, it really just depends. And then uh, less controlled environments outside of that, it depends even further. So, but, all of this would provide you with information on trends in the ancillary environments that may potentially impact the critical environments later on. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Um, we'll do one more question for you, Commander Heinmeier. Um, Where should the particle probe be when sampling a LAFW or BSC? Thank you, that, that's a great question. So the particle probe should be located close to the critical aseptic processing work activity. So uh, our guidance that was published in 2004, the aseptic guidance says about a foot. So within, within about a foot of that activity, if possible, if it doesn't disturb um, the airflow or cause any other problems. Uh, so that would provide you an accurate representation of the production environment without interfering with critical production processes. 
but also the probe orientation should be in the direction of the airflow. So basically, if it's a vertical airflow, you don't want to you certainly don't want to see the probe horizontal and vice versa if it's the other way around. Thank you. Thank you for that response as well. We appreciate that information. And now we'll address some questions that came in for um, Ms. Don Trangvall. Uh, Trang, what is the specific EM sampling requirement in an ISO 5 environment during production? Okay, um, we might have some trouble hearing you, um, Trang, if, if uh, you're trying to connect your, your microphone. We'll um, move back to some questions that came in for Commander Heitmeyer here um, while we troubleshoot some of those issues in the meantime. Um, next question it, for Commander Heitmeyer, uh, is there a mandatory requirement for humidity specification in the aseptic area? Great question again. Um, yeah, so FDA does not provide a specific uh, a, a specification for humidity in aseptic areas per se. However, um, if you look to our 503B CGMP draft guidance that was published in January 2020, which is referenced in the slides, um, it says uh, a specification for humidity should be established considering that higher humidity supports microbial growth, while too little humidity can cause problems with static electricity. So that's particularly when there is uh, powders involved and may lead to increased particulates. So I would say that uh, while FDA doesn't have a published um, specification for humidity uh, within regulation or guidance that I know of, um, I would, you can look to other organizations um, that can uh, help you establish it for your own facility op op operations. So USP and PDA have published recommendations uh, generally for just like clean room environments. And so if that works for you, um, I would look there. But it's, it's a wide open question. So it, it just really depends on what you're doing at your facility and that all needs to be taken into account. Thank you. Thank you for that response as well. Um, we do have another question for you. Um, how do new strains of viruses impact the testing requirements? Thank you for that question. I'm, I'm not really sure um, where, where the, uh, the questioner was going with this. Uh, so, but with respect to environmental monitoring, there's there's no requirements to monitor viruses. So for viable monitoring, we're only really looking at bacteria, yeast, and molds. So that that's it for for environmental monitoring only. That's so I'm not speaking to anything else. Thank you. Great. Thank you again. All right. So I think um, we are trying to fix that connection there. Um, we'll go back to that question for um, Ms. Trang Vuong. Uh, what is the specific EM sampling requirement in an ISO 5 environment during production? My apology. Um, thank you, that's a great question. For, from the FDA 2004 aseptic uh, guidance, Aaron, air and surface samples should be taken at the locations where significant activity or product exposures occur during productions. Um, so for critical surface sampling, this, sh this should be performed at the conclusions of aseptic processing operations to avoid direct contact with sterile surfaces um, during processing. However, uh, the sampling should be performed prior to cleaning um, and then for active air sampling in the ISO 5 area, it should be performed at least daily during productions operations or in association with 
each lot. And the same thing for the critical area should normally you know microbial contaminations. Um, with respect to personal monitoring, monitoring should be accompanied by obtaining surface samples of each operator gloves on a daily basis or in associate with each lot. Um, for personal samples should include, the site could be fingertips, glove fingertips, um, face mask, forearm, chest, those are the few examples. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Uh, we have another question for you. Does following USP 797 fulfill the CGMP requirement for EM? Um, so that's a great question. Um, so no, following the USP 797 alone would not necessarily fulfill the CGMP requirement. Um, there are other requirements that goes beyond the um, USP 797. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. Um, Another question for you, what is the growth promotion microorganism panel requirements or expectations for EM media? So um, in regard to growth promotion testing of media use in um, EMs and personal monitoring um, testing, so in our 2020 uh, 503 BC CGMP draft guidance. It stated that if the media used are not purchased from a qualified supplier, the outsourcing facility or contract laboratory procedure should establish the valid validity of, of each medium, including its growth potential. So essentially, um, you should be able to demonstrate that your in house media can reliably recover microorganisms. Um, so, if your EM media are purchase media, you can use the supplier C of A. However, it should be from a qualified supplier. You shouldn't have a you should have a quality agreement with the supplier, and that may include um, testing record of like for growth promotion testing as part of the release testing uh, that the supplier will perform prior to them shipping the media lot to you. It also should include a commitment to notify you if a problem with the media may arrive um, after the, the lot have been shipped. And thank you for that question. Thank you for that response as well. We have another question for you. Would a detection of a microbial contamination from a surface sample during aseptic processing result in a batch rejection? Um, so that's another great question. Thank you. Um, so yes, it can, but it depends on where the recovery is from. So for recoveries from an ISO 5 area, during or after production should be a cause for great alarms. And in an investigation, and I'm sorry, an investigation should be conducted. Um, uh, so it could be hard to invalidate a failing EM result. So use, use um, so usually the prevailing action is based on a risk assessment and the abundance of cautions with respect to sterility assurance. Um, so, you know, it would be it would be hard for if you have a, uh, for example, if you have a microbial contaminate that you um, recover from a filling needle, I would think it might be um, hard to justify um, that, uh, justify saving the batch um, and saying that the um, that you have a sterility assurance if you found microbial contaminations in the filling needles. Um, 
that. Thank you. All right, thank you as well. Um, oh, sorry, we'll do one more question for you. Do you need to identify a definitive root cause for an EM excursion? Um, so for EM excursions, if the excursion exceed an action level, um, then an investigation should be conducted as part of the investigation. And as part of the investigation, you should attempt to identify the root cause. Uh, but also, if you can't find the root cause, maybe a potential root cause, um, as sometimes EM excursions may be difficult to, the root cause for EM excursion may be difficult to identify. Thank you. All right, thank you again. Now we'll address some questions that came in uh, for Commander Heitmeyer again. Um, what is the FDA's thoughts on facilities going to a fully electronic means of recording and reporting all EM activities versus paper? Would FDA support such an effort and would electronic recording and reporting be an advantage in becoming more compliant? Thank you, thank you, thank you for that question. That's a great question. Uh, yes, FDA certainly supports the use of uh, electronic means um, um, all over, um, really. I think we have some published guidance about uh, electronic batch records, but I won't go into that. But there is no requirement really to make uh, paper records. So you, you're, you're completely free to have everything electronic if you want it to be. But however, I would say if you're going to switch to a lot of electronic means for, uh, you know, your records, then you have to be in compliance with uh, 21 CFR Part 11. And so this is the regulation that um, is over electronic records specifically for drug production. But also you want to make sure that um, whatever systems that you have in place, databases, uh, soft, you know, all computer systems, whatever it is, have controls in place to maintain data integrity. So you, you need user IDs specific to each person, passwords, you have to limit the access level. So what I mean by that is an indiv individual operator can't go in and change the, the record for the environment monitoring that they did or anything like that or delete it or do any uh, of those sort of things but certainly the agency there's there's no requirement to have a paper record from the agency so thank you thank you for that response another question for you isn't adverse event reporting required for 503b's Thank you. That's a great question. Yes, it, it certainly is. So um, under 21 CFR uh, 310, I don't know the rest of I can't remember the rest of it, but under that uh, regulation, 503Bs are required to report adverse events. However, reporting of ADEs uh, is not part of the scope of this webinar, and neither Trang or I are experts in reporting requirements. So all I can tell you is yes, uh, 503Bs are required, but I can't go into any detail because that's not our field. Thank you. Thank you for that information as well. Another question for you, Commander Hutmer, is a compounding pharmacy required to have EM? Yes. So compounding pharmacies must abide by what we call insanitary conditions. They don't have to abide by GMPs, which was part of my presentation. But the lack of EM, like completely, we we normally would consider that uh, an insanitary condition when sterile drugs are being produced. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, now we'll uh, address a question that came in for um, Dong Trang. Uh, your slide said alert and action levels should be established based on data collected in your facility. 
However, USP 797 designates the alert and action limits. So should the levels really be based on the facility data or 797? So thank you for that question. Um, so as previously mentioned, following USP chapter 797 alone does not necessarily fulfill all the CGMP requirements. So for outsourcing facility, uh, we would recommend they, for you to set your alert level, alert and action um, limit based on your facility data. Um, and not and not based and yeah based on your facility data thank you all right thank you so much for that response um let's see we have another question that came in for you um is it acceptable for an outsourcing facility to only use settling plates for monitoring viable air and not use any active air sampling um, thank you for that question. So, um, no, the use of only set on plate for monitoring viable air and not, um, and to not use any active air sampling is not acceptable for our sourcing facility. Um, however, you can use uh, the use of cellar plate, settling plate is optional. Uh, if you have um, active air sampling that is performed adequately. Thank you. Thank you so much for that information. Uh, we might have time for one more question for you. Um, when should personnel monitoring be done? Before entry to an aseptic area for production or after production in an aseptic area? Um, so, Person sampling um, should be uh, performed after productions in an aseptic area. Um, and that is to really want to demonstrate your, um, that you want to demonstrate the process that you perform have been, um, it's to provide a, true representations of your production environment um, and what was what's being done and that you are your operators or your process is being performed aseptically um, and there's there's not a contamination risk or occurs at you know during your process. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much again for that response. Uh, looks like that is all the questions we have time for today. Um, again, thank you so much to our presenters today for all the excellent information.